Today, we'll be talking about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, a potentially lethal tick-borne infection which is curable if it's caught early but can be difficult to diagnose. For this college professor and avid outdoorsman from North Carolina, an inappropriate delay in diagnosis and treatment led to a serious, life-threatening illness. Rob was a 53-year-old English professor at a liberal arts college in rural North Carolina. One week in the late spring, Rob began having fevers, fatigue, and nausea. He tried taking over-the-counter acetaminophen and antacids, but they didn't seem to help. Three days into his illness, his symptoms were no better, and he had also developed an excruciating headache, so he decided to go to the local acute care clinic. Rob told the clinic physician that, other than the current symptoms, he considered himself to be an extremely healthy person. He had no chronic health problems, and he prided himself on being very active. He enjoyed gardening, hiking and mountain climbing, fly fishing with his friends on the weekends, and long runs with his dog. Especially with the recent onset of the beautiful spring weather, he was spending time outside almost daily. On exam, he had a fever, but his other vital signs and the remainder of his physical exam were normal. The clinic physician told Rob that the symptoms were most likely related to a viral infection, which should resolve on its own in a few days. He also mentioned that a tick-borne infection was a possibility this time of year, but since Rob didn't report having a tick bite and had no signs of a rash on physical exam, the physician decided not to prescribe antibiotics. He told Rob to come back if his symptoms got worse or if he developed a rash, and Rob went home planning to rest and wait out the illness. Two days later, when Rob's sister came to his house to check on him, she found him in bed, breathing hard and difficult to arouse. She called 911, and Rob was brought by ambulance to the nearest hospital. When he arrived, the doctor saw that he appeared sleepy and short of breath. He had a fever, rapid breathing, and rapid heart rate, and his oxygen saturation was decreased to 85%. On his lower arms and legs, he had a rash consisting of two to three millimeter red lesions, most of which failed to blanch with gentle pressure. Blood was drawn and showed a low platelet count. A lumbar puncture was performed, and results of the cerebrospinal fluid analysis showed normal protein and glucose levels, and only a minimal increase in the white blood cells present in the fluid. Gram staining of the CSF showed no organisms. Together, these results made it unlikely that he had a bacterial meningitis, which was an important consideration given his altered mental status, fever, and rash. A chest x-ray showed diffuse interstitial fluid in Rob's lungs, as opposed to a more focal consolidation, which would be seen in conditions like pneumonia. Because of Rob's unstable vital signs and his compromised lung function, he was admitted to the intensive care unit where he could receive oxygen, fluids, and close hemodynamic monitoring. The doctors recognized that one of the most likely causes of Rob's rash, fever, and subsequent complications, especially in the late spring season, was a tick-borne infection. They immediately started Rob on the antibiotic doxycycline, which is the treatment of choice for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Despite its name, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever most commonly occurs in the southeastern United States, although it's been reported throughout North and South America. This infection is caused by the intracellular gram-negative bacteria Rickettsia rickettsii. Rickettsia is transmitted to humans by tick bite, but up to one-third of patients, like Rob, don't report any history of a tick bite because the bites are painless and the tick can be hidden by hair or skin folds. After the tick has been attached for 6 to 10 hours, bacteria are released from the tick salivary glands into the host tissue. The bacterial outer membrane proteins and lipopolysaccharide bind to the endothelial cell surface within nearby blood vessels, provoking a signaling cascade that rearranges the actin filaments in the host cell and engulfs the bacterium. This allows it to enter the intracellular environment where it utilizes host cell resources to persist and replicate. 
The bacteria can then travel rapidly from cell to cell by recruiting and polymerizing host actin filaments, and they can also spread to more distant sites in the body through the bloodstream and lymphatics. Rickettsia rickettsii can cause direct damage to the infected endothelial cells, leading to cell necrosis and the CD8-positive effector T-cell response to the infected cells can induce apoptosis of the affected cells. The net effect of these changes is damage to the vessel walls, which leads the immune system to deploy additional lymphocytes and macrophages to the site of infection. When the infection goes untreated, as it did for Rob, the widespread inflammation and damage to the vessel walls causes microscopic bleeding and thrombosis, consuming the circulating platelets and leading to a decreased platelet count. The damage and inflammation also causes increased vascular permeability and local swelling. The excess fluid in Rob's lungs and brain had led to his difficulty breathing and his altered mental status. Diagnosis of this infection can be very difficult because it typically begins with very nonspecific symptoms that don't necessarily imply a specific diagnosis unless one lives in an endemic area and maintains a very high index of suspicion for this infection. Also, rapid diagnostic tests for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever aren't available in most clinical labs. Furthermore, the characteristic rash may not develop until three to five days into the infection, and in about 10% of cases, the rash never develops at all. So Rob should have been given empiric antibiotics when he first came to the doctor with suspicious symptoms, even without a rash or known history of tick bite. If he had received doxycycline at his first visit, he probably could have been cured as an outpatient and avoided these serious, life-threatening complications. Rob's blood was sent to the state lab for serological testing for antibodies against rickettsia, but the doctors knew that these results would take time to come back, and the serologies are often negative during the first several days of the illness, so this test wouldn't affect the initial treatment for Rob. A biopsy was also taken from an area of Rob's skin that was affected by the rash. This biopsy was taken as early as possible after starting antibiotics because the likelihood of finding the rickettsia organism in the tissues decreases rapidly after antibiotic therapy has begun. The local pathologist saw that within the dermis, lymphocytes and macrophages had infiltrated around the blood vessels, and the endothelial cells appeared swollen. This finding was consistent with rickettsia infection, but not conclusive because other types of rashes could cause a similar appearance. Gram stain of the tissue was negative. Direct immunofluorescence for rickettsia was not available in the local lab facility, so a tissue sample was sent out to a specialized lab for immunostaining. A few days later, the result came back that rickettsia antigen was detected in the endothelial cells from the skin biopsy specimen, confirming the diagnosis of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. After three days on antibiotics, Rob's fever resolved, and over the next several days, he became gradually more alert and his breathing improved. After two weeks in the hospital, Rob was well enough to be discharged home. A follow-up serology drawn around the time Rob left the hospital showed elevated IgG and IgM antibodies against rickettsia, further confirming the diagnosis serologically. Rob remained moderately fatigued for several weeks after his illness, but within a couple of months, he had returned to work and was gradually resuming his regular, active lifestyle.